Starboard targets are hard to get at, hard to hit. Shore defense presents special tough problems. Against air attack, the enemy stations flak boats well out at sea to signal the alarm. Air centers collate intelligence, organize flights of land-based defense fighters. Barrage balloons prevent low-level attack, and concentrations of anti-aircraft send up a thick pattern of fire. The Tirpitz, here knocked out on April 3, 1944, was reported July 31, 1944, repaired and ready for action again. Against sea attack, enemy destroyers scout the waterway approaches to the harbor, as do patrol planes. Small fleets of mine layers make these approaches hazardous. Hydrophonic detectors stand by to dispatch squadrons of fighter planes. And finally, coast artillery, light guns, big guns. The harbor is a good shelter. Booms, submarine nets, minefields, coast guns, anti-aircraft, nearby airports, radar. The sweeter the target, the heavier the shore defense. Allied naval superiority may have forced the Nazis and Japanese to landlock their warships for protection, but these landlocked ships nevertheless serve as threats to our convoys, tie up important Allied units which have to stand guard against sneak hit-and-run raids. Enemy bridges could be blown up, troop ships could be hit at the moment of disembarkation, canals could be bottled up, submarine pens put out of commission, but shore defense protects them well against normal sea and air attacks. Every major German and Japanese held harbor presents in itself a number of tempting objectives. All these and many more are choice targets, and yet to date shore defense makes it difficult to destroy them without disproportionately expensive losses in men and equipment. In the spring of 1944 at Chesapeake Bay, a different form of attack was tested involving a single missile, which, using special OSS techniques, could get through enemy harbor barriers by deception, which could be precisely controlled to a specific target, and which, operating without personnel, would be expendable. For purposes of this test, two men are used to take the motorboat out to its point of rendezvous with the plane. The plane carries on board the Campbell operator, who alone will control the motorboat, even though he will be miles away when rendezvous is established. The boat is a 34-foot A2 hacker craft with a low silhouette. Powered by a 550 horsepower engine, it can do 35 miles an hour for a range of 220 miles, while carrying a maximum load of 5,000 pounds of explosive. The range can be extended by adding gas tanks. The craft is a projectile. It carries no personnel. In addition to its explosive charge, it has a radio control receiver and a television transmitter. The television camera, housed in the white box on the bow, is standard Army Air Force's portable equipment. In this test, a plane is used as the control. All the equipment the Campbell operator needs is a television receiver, including the screen, and a radio transmitter. Instead of the plane, the operator could be in a mothership, a submarine, another motorboat, or at a concealed position ashore. Rendezvous is established. The operator studies his screen, now takes over control. From this point on, the motorboat is entirely governed by radio and television. Control by television can be successfully operated at ranges up to 85 miles. The television camera constantly scans the scene over the bow of the missile and transmits the images. The operator on the plane clearly sees the missile's course and by radio, he sends out impulses, completely controlling the missile's direction and speed. Television makes it possible for the operator to steer the boat clear of harbor craft, buoys, surface defensive obstructions. The motorboat is precisely controlled by radio. Even in these tests, 
where a wide margin of safety is observed to avoid collision with Chesapeake Bay shipping, the boat is brought up close to theoretical targets. The motorboat speeds head on into the freighter, is constantly guided by the operator in the plane, who abruptly brings it up short. Another shot, camera this time aboard the target. The operator takes the boat out on a test run. Still far off, he searches his television screen, picks a ferry boat in the bay as a sample target. The missile keeps coming until the operator swings it off course. Preliminary tests having proved successful, preparations were begun in August 1944 on full-scale tests involving actual operational factors the SS San Pablo, a 5,000-ton freighter anchored in the Gulf of Mexico off Pensacola, was selected as the target. Work began on the disguise. For deception purposes, Campbell lends itself easily to a variety of possibilities. As a fishing boat native to the area of operations, as one of the miscellaneous utility craft that crowd harbors, even as an enemy supply or light combat vessel, such as the German e-boat. In this case, the hacker was converted into a rusty, weather-beaten Danish spritzel fishing boat. The job, aging included, took a week. The choice of the fishing boat disguise is especially apt for an OSS sabotage operation. No matter how thoroughly guarded an enemy-held harbor may be, the authorities, pressed for food, are forced to let the local fishing fleet continue operating. The missile, properly disguised, could be slipped into the fleet from a mother ship, from a submarine, or by OSS operatives working in enemy territory. Once inside the harbor, it would be guided by remote radio television control into the target. The hacker, converted into a Danish fisherman, rides heavy seas, the plywood hull built over the false frame takes the pounding with no sign of distress. The disguise, however, is not completed. To kill the giveaway speedboat exhaust, special mufflers are attached. The motors themselves are soundproofed by nailing thick layers of cellotex to the hatches. Provision is made to simulate the characteristic chug-chug of a fishing boat diesel engine motion picture soundtrack and sound head are placed on shock mounts under the false deck house aft. The strip of film is spliced into a continuous loop. The chug chug repeats endlessly. Also under the false deck house is a mechanism which chemically produces smoke. The pot, not shown here, is placed under the blower. The alternate timer sends the smoke out in natural puffs properly synchronized with the simulated engine exhaust. As for underwater monitors, hydrophonic detectors will not distinguish the speedboat's motors from a fishing craft's engines when the speed is under 800 RPM. Under 800 RPM, the reception on both types of engines is the same. To determine this point, hydrophonic detection tests were made with an ARB at Fisher Island. The ARB speed is 600 RPM. This is the sound picked up on the hydrophonic detectors. All boat traffic in the vicinity was stopped for purposes of these tests. Speeds, in this case 1500 RPM, the reception on the ARB is different. Now at 2,500 RPM. A JR boat tested at 500 RPM gives this recording on the hydrophonic detector. the JR at 1,000 RPM.
now at 2,400 RPM. The disguised missile will of necessity be making its approach to the target at the normal speed of fishing craft, which of course is well under 800 RPM. At such speeds, hydrophonic detectors, as demonstrated, will not differentiate the speedboat's motors. When the missile goes over 800 RPM, it is on its target run, and the necessity for disguise no longer exists. To get back to the Danish fishing boat K354, Emil firmly grasps the tiller and the disguise is finished. Behind the plywood, the serious business begins of fitting into place the high explosive charges. The pinup device might be called the nose of the projectile. It works on the principle of a double barreled pistol. Fixed on the concealed boom, it's the first to hit the target. On contact, an explosive charge shoots the two pins deep into the hull. Steel cables are fastened to the pins and hold the load of depth bombs close to the target. Contact with the pinup also detonates the scuttling charge, made up of primer cord, mudded inside the hull of the missile two feet below the gunnels. The primer cord will scuttle the craft, will release the depth bombs which are hydrostatic fused to explode at a depth of 25 to 30 feet. <laughs> 